William Sashiti is a force of nature. He is a UK-based serial entrepreneur best known for creating a UK driverless car manufacturer company competing with multinational incumbents such as Google, Uber, and Tesla. He is one of the smartest entrepreneurs and inventors. Born in Zimbabwe, he moved to the UK at the age of 17, where he created numerous other startups. His most recent creations are the driverless car, Cargo, and the open source technology for Africa, dubbed as Trees of Knowledge. He is making great impact on humanity and living the dream. Here we go. It's William Sashiti on the Barry Media Show. Thank you, William, for this interview. Welcome to the Barry Media Show. You are in the United Kingdom. You are known to be a serial entrepreneur and an inventor. You have founded a couple of startups in the past. Can you give us the name of some startups that you have created or founded in the past? Um, hi. Uh, so, yes, a pleasure to be here. So, um, I started my entrepreneur journey many years ago, um, and I've done, I think, three startups, which I was lucky enough to have all of them acquired or bought by somebody. Um, so yeah, I started my entrepreneur journey when I was about 19 years old, when the first was a company called 123 Registration. And what we were doing was domain registration online. This is many years ago when Google had just started. And then a few years later, did another startup, which I took over to BBC's Dragon's Den, um, which they hated, by the way, uh, but it was their loss because the company did quite all right and someone acquired it in the end. Um, and then another one was in the experiences and things to do space. And then the latest is called Cargo, which does self-driving vehicles. And that's my entrepreneur journey so far. I am very intrigued by the autonomous or driverless delivery vehicle, Cargo, and also your most recent invention, open source technology known as Trees of Knowledge, which we are going to talk about in a length in a minute because it is mind-blowing. But before we get to that, can you please talk a little bit about Cargo, the autonomous delivery vehicle that is now making a buzz, even competing against Google and Tesla from what I read? Um, well, kind of, yes. So Cargo is, um, the problem we're trying to solve is that to move anything from A to B in the world is relatively cheap until that thing you're trying to move gets to the local depot to your house. This is called the last mile problem. It is worth literally trillions every year and um, retailers struggle with this problem. Now, it's universally agreed that the best way to solve this problem is through automation. So what my team and I are doing is we've designed and are building self-driving cars which will automate this process of delivery so the concept is if you buy something online we should be able to get an autonomous vehicle to drive whatever you've bought to your house in preferably less than 30 minutes and that's cargo so it's autonomous vehicles which deliver packages to your house nice nice so the vehicle uses uh self-driveless technology to drive itself to locations where it deliver packages autonomously, right? Is that the case? Yes, that is the case. So um, what happened actually with Cargo is um, since my last company got acquired, I really had a long think about what I wanted to do next. And I realized I'm at that point as an entrepreneur where I could build some cool app, raise a couple of million pounds of investment from investors, and then sell that cool app for a lot of money but the world doesn't need a faster way to book a restaurant i don't think and so i looked at where the current technology was um, and i realized there may be value in working in automation using robotics but i didn't think my skill set was strong enough to be able to support running a company of that sort so i actually went back to university to study artificial intelligence and robotics with a team of very smart people. 
And there I found some people who then became my team who now work at Cargo, helping us with the computer science that's evolved to make cars drive themselves. So how soon these driverless vehicles are going to be in the streets of, U- of the United Kingdom? Or are they well, already in the streets? Well, we've already launched. We launched um, in about July last year at, a, at an event called the Goodwood Festival of Speed. Um, and eyes turned, a lot of press came, a lot of news vans came, and people were very excited because our cars, as you probably know, they look like an absolute spaceship. So they've been launched. Um, but we're now going through a process called IVA, which is where we get our number plate. This allows us to then produce more of them and have them driven on the road with other cars anytime, any day. Can you please give us some background about yourself? So, I mean, I, I don't think I was... I grew up in Zimbabwe, in um, Harare, Zimbabwe. I went to Greyston Park Primary School. Um, and then from Greyston Park Primary School, um. I went to Oriel Boys High School in Chisipite. Um, Yeah, and did most of my junior or younger education and secondary education in Zimbabwe and then came to England straight to work when I was about 17, I think. And so I've lived in England since. Um, and then I found my calling as an entrepreneur um, and did my first startup um, about 19, I think I explained earlier. So yeah, that, that's how my journey started. Stood first in Zimbabwe, then moved over to England. And then, yeah, but I always had an affinity to technology and solving problems. I think if you speak with most entrepreneurs, we call it the entrepreneur curse, where you can't help but solve problems. And so, yeah, solving problems where they started. And that's why when I was describing cargo earlier, the first thing I said is the problem we're trying to solve is this, because that's why we innovate. We innovate to try and solve a specific problem. And the case of cargo, that problem is, is the last mile problem, the problem of price moving stuff from A to B. So what did you study in university, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, so I went to university in Wales in the UK, and this was maybe four, three, four years ago. And I studied artificial intelligence and robotics. Yes. So this is sort of a diversion of computer science, where it's the science of making, essentially tricking or making computers think for themselves. So it's a lot of algorithms being trained to learn by themselves and then making them do things. So it's like capturing a bit of human intelligence and then expressing it in a computer and then forcing it to perform just a very simple task. It sounds complex, but a very narrow version of this is um, a calculator. It's very, very reliable. It will always give you the right equation, um, the right answer at least. And so the science that I studied is making this calculator really, really, really advanced. And so it's just layers on a calculator really. And so it's just very powerful computing, processing power, um, plus very clever algorithms that it then evolves and learns for itself. And that is the science of artificial intelligence. Wow. Great. All right. So now let's talk about trees of knowledge. Now let's talk about trees of knowledge that I believe to be mind blowing. I know your most recent invention is the open source technology that helped improve access to education in Africa. On yeah. January 31st of this year, you published it. The open source technology is also known, is known as trees of knowledge. Can you please explain how this open source technology works? Sure. I mean, so let's go back to the motive, actually. I'm going to start from why this or, 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 or why I created this. So the world has a type of lottery system, right? And this lottery system, it, it could define whether you're going to live or die in some instances. And so that's the lottery of life. So some people who are lucky enough to be born in maybe Europe, uh, England, America, they pretty much won the primary lottery. Other people, if you're unlucky and you're born in um, what's called the desert of, I don't know, near Sudan or, or in, in Ethiopia or even some parts of Southern Africa, you've lost the lottery of life. You don't have the freedom to travel any country you want in the world. Um, and so that's the lottery. However, there is one get out, get out clause from this sort of lottery. The get out clause is education. And it's the only escape. However, education is not an abundant resource. It's not a free resource as well, and it's not easy to find. And so as someone who grew up in Zimbabwe, where 
my, you know, we grew up in Greystoke Park, a fairly rich area. However, we would have to travel like for summer holidays, you know, in Africa, summer holiday, you've got a month of school, you travel to the grandparents. And they would live in the villages where you meet other kids who are just exact same age as you. You spend one to two months with them, but they don't go to school. There's no running water. They get up first thing in the morning. Their job is to go herd cattle. You go out with them. So when you've experienced this, but then you've got the luxury to go back to your big house in the suburbs when they don't, you see a unique problem which people outside of Africa just don't get. And so it then hit me that I'm, you know, well, what's you know, it's something I always wanted to play a part in. But I thought I, I just don't have the time because my time is spent at the moment doing self-driving cars. After that, I'm probably going to do household robots, like doing robot butlers and stuff. And I probably won't have time for this, this innovation I had. So I thought, let me throw my hat into the gauntlet of education and use technology, all of that technology, to increase access to education by inventing something. And the invention is called Trees of Knowledge. And it goes something like this. <clears throat> so some stats for you. In Southern Africa alone, there are about 34 million kids that don't go to school. However, weird fact is, is reported that nearly everybody, even the poverty-stricken ones, they have some sort of smartphone, or some sort of old phone. The reason this is, is the poverty in Africa has caused Southern African countries like Zimbabwe to innovate and go cashless. So because we have no cash, we simply all use mobile phones as a currency tool. We ended up having abundance in cheap phones. They're not the best, they're not for the best phone. So if you live in the rural areas, there's a strong chance you actually have a phone. But there's two things you don't have. You don't have access to the internet with that phone and you don't have to charge that phone. So it hit me that we have a device which is a gateway to all of Earth's information, but we can't get to it. So I thought, okay, what if we did some sort of artificial Wi-Fi that would allow internet to be available in rural areas? But then mobile phone networks have tried this, and it's expensive. That's why they've not done this. So it's not going to solve the problem. And then it hit me that what if we make a very, very, very small, low-powered computer preloaded with video content. I'm talking so small and so cheap. This thing is worth less than $60. So this small computer can be placed in a strategic location, such as a landmark or a tree, and it's preloaded with educational content. So this means anyone with a mobile phone of any description, if they walk near this tree, a Wi-Fi connection appears on their phone. They say, hey, Wi-Fi. If they connect onto this Wi-Fi connection, just like that, there's an archive of videos they can watch. These videos are the entire educational syllabus. So all we've done is we've made a mini, a mini sort of video library that anyone can access if you're close to this tiny computer. Okay, so, so where do the trees come in? So a little known fact is a lot of kids who actually go to school around a lot of Africa go to school under a tree because there are not enough classes. So the teacher is the chap in the middle and is teaching kids. If you look for it on Google now, you'll find many images of kids gathered under a tree. So all we're doing is with Trees of Knowledge is we're substituting that teacher with a digital teacher. So kids can still go under a tree, the same system. However, there is now a digital teacher Think Siri for your smartphone, but that Siri is a very stupid Siri that only has access to educational content. And if anyone is close, they can access a digital avatar or an archive of videos and learn their entire educational syllabus. And that's what Trees of Knowledge is. So we're putting microcomputers with preloaded educational content and then broadcasting a signal from the top of a tree so that anyone who's within, say, 100 meters can access this educational content. And the best bit is this could be done at ultra low power for a cost of less than $60. Uh, per year or per month? Permanently. So whilst, yes. um, whilst I understand that it's, it's better to maybe build schools and um, train teachers and uh, get books, uniforms, it's very expensive. 
And what the idea was with this is we're talking, you can put deployed so quickly, so cheaply. So yes, go ahead, build a school. But in that time, in the year it takes you to cover a thousand students worth of an area, you could deploy these, these trees of knowledge much cheaper at a cost of $60 each at the loss of our two years. So what type of technology is involved in this, uh, in your invention? What type of technology is involved? So it's actually very simple technology that exists today. So if we go back to maybe 10 years ago, um, computers were very big. They're very clunky. So smartphones were invented. And the race for smartphones and iPads um, to give you a faster iPad every year and force you to upgrade has caused a unique side effect. This side effect is that computing has become very cheap and much smaller. So the smartphone in your pocket is about 100,000 times more powerful than the computer which took man to the moon in the 60s. So because we can now fit so much processing power on a small form factor, it's actually very, very cheap to buy a microcomputer, as we call them, for literally $20. And so it's, it's a standard microcomputer or Raspberry Pi, whatever type. There's many variations. Any will do. So it's a microcomputer and clever software and a Wi-Fi, and a Wi-Fi router. That's it. So a low-power, 5-volt Wi-Fi router, microcomputer, and that's it. You're good to go. So can you please explain in detail how the Wi-Fi connection works with this open source technology? Oh, yeah, very simple. So we've got a computer, we plug in the Wi-Fi router, and that's it. Just like your Wi-Fi at home or your Wi-Fi in an internet cafe. All the user sees is, oh, it's a Wi-Fi connection. So how long had you been working on this technology before releasing it on January 31st? It's something I thought about. And then I wrote the entire paper in a day, all 18 pages. And then I had my team revise it and look at it to double, double check um, that, that human me has not made any mistakes. Um, but it was all relatively quick. Um, because remember, one could argue my team and I are oh, amongst the highest level of knowledge in technology. We create the stuff. So for us, it's, it's, it's easy to innovate and create something new because our day job is much more complex. We make cars drive themselves. Um, so this is just simple innovation. I see. So what are the challenges you went through? And what type of challenges you think uh, people who would be using your technology in Africa will be facing, if any? So I've actually written a 18-page document which details exactly what the problem is, what the solution is, how to build a solution, um, what the challenges are, how we're solving those challenges. I mean, it's a really long sort of document to go through uh, the specifics of right now. But um, the, the, one of the bigger ones was power. So we know, um, I had some dealings with um, one of the larger mobile phone companies in Zimbabwe some time ago. Um, and I was innovating for them. And they mentioned a very unique problem to me, which was when they go to rural areas, people often have their phones off. And this is because there's no power, there's no electricity to charge their phones. So when they go to sell the SIM cards, people turn their phone on, they make their phone call, and they turn the phone off again. The phones are always off and only turned on when required to make a call or to send a message. So trees of knowledge, whilst everyone's got a phone, they're in the power. So we solved this by, at the base of a tree, I designed a base station which can charge any phone. So you'll know you've got to a tree of knowledge by finding a stone base station which has got inside it a solar charging system for any phone. So so long as you've got a USB cable and your phone, you can use that tree and be charging all day. So those, those are some of the considerations I had to that we had to innovate around. But um yeah it's 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 not a perfect system. That's the whole point of putting it open source. So the idea is if I put it open source, no one else can patent it and no one else can make money from it. So instead, it's given free to everybody. So if anybody wants to use it or use any part of the technology, they can. And the cost is zero because I don't believe in making money from education 
what, what I'd recommend for your listeners is definitely um, look up the word trees of knowledge and then the word Africa or Zimbabwe next to it. It'll be the first result of Google and have a skim through the paper. Because um, I think there's certain things where there are illustrations in that paper where you have to see those illustrations for it to make sense. What is included? Like what is preloaded in these devices? What type so of courses? That's not, that's, not thing. that's not for me to solve. So all I did with this is I created the concept for the technology, detailed how to do it, and then someone with time and funding can then finish it all off. The whole point of open source is it's open source, but um, yeah, anyone else can jump in at this point. So it depends. If uh, NGOs want to do it, they can. If the governments want to do it, they can. But uh, it's, it's, it's an open platform. It's a bit like giving a person, like when Apple gave smartphones, there were no apps. Apple didn't actually give apps. App developers then made the ecosystem of apps that we have today. And similarly, this is an enabling technology where, here you go, here's the technology. I've now shown you how you can cheaply make a free and educator. The question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to put in it? And that's for the countries or companies involved in this space to figure out. So you said this is going to be free. There's no cost per unit, right? It's just going to be completely, you pay the $60 and that's it? No, so it's, I'm not selling anything. So it's $60 worth of parts. If anyone wants to implement it, it'll cost them $60 to get all the parts. So I'm not making anything. I'm literally giving it all like, here's the specification. Here's, if you want to do it, you can buy the parts and do it yourself. And that's the whole point of the guide. It's a full guide on how they can do it themselves without me being involved. I say, have you already gotten any demand for your product from any African country right now? Uh, yes, a lot. Um, but these are ongoing conversations. Um, they're slow because I just, I, time is my biggest thing. I've got a full-time sort of job I spend all my time doing. But yeah, I've had a lot of interest from some of the biggest companies in the world that got in touch as a result. But we'll see what happens. Um, and again, for me, um, as much as I'd love to get involved, I can't commit time to it because I, I've got investors who who are who are chasing for my other company, and I need to meet them. My sort of my commitments there. So, how can people get a hold of you if they wanted to get more information about your um, trees of knowledge? So, so, trees of knowledge. Um, the best way is just go on Google and go on the paper. There is a very big, like I said, eighteen pages. It's even the frequently asked questions, everything they need is there, and that's as much as I can give on it. Um, any person with any sort of computing skill can implement it and can build it in, a, in literally a matter of an hour. It's that simple. And then myself, I'm available on LinkedIn or on social media. Great. Are you working on any futuristic projects right now? Because I know you're a serial inventor. This, you're, you're, you're fascinating. <laughs> I think um, it doesn't get any more futuristic than driverless cars. But maybe I might give you a sneak peek of what's behind my desk at the moment. Hang on a second. Oh. So I won't even explain what it is. But just know that this is what happens inside a roboticist's lab. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, William, for a great interview. Thank you for sharing all this great information. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. Thanks to my guest, William Sashiti the Zimbabwean-born British. Thanks to you for listening. The Barry Media Show takes you places that you have never imagined. You can find me on Instagram at Barry Medias and on Twitter at Barry Medias. Please stop by and say hi, and please tell your friends about the show. Tune in next week for another great interview.